shout out to everybody watching online now live as well as into the future. So let's say hello to everybody online, everybody in here. <laughs> uh, tonight's lecture is the very first one in our semester long series of Science Night Live. We've got a great lineup this semester. We're starting off with when dinosaurs ruled New York, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But I want to tell you about some other upcoming programs with Science Night Live. Coming next week, this one isn't in the evening, but we wanted to mention this one. We, we do an annual celebration here at Hofstra of Darwin Day. Uh, there'll be some reenactments from the life of Darwin and a lot of conversation about Darwin. That will be at the, at the Guthard Cultural Center Theater near the, at the Hofstra Library. Uh, next week, Wednesday at 11.15. We hope you can make that. Coming up uh, in March, same place, same time as tonight's lecture, we have Superbugs and Superdrugs, the Future of Antibiotics with Dr. Scott Lefferge from our Department of Chemistry. And then coming up on Wednesday, April 13th, same time, same place, Hunting for Microbes on Long Island with, with uh, Professor Javier Esquerdo from the uh, Department of Biology here at Hofstra. So we have a great lineup and we hope you all can, can, can attend. Tonight though, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Brett Bennington, a professor of geology here at Hofstra University. Dr. Bennington is somewhat of an institution here at Hofstra. He's been here since 1993 and, is, uh, and has done a great job here in, in helping to build our geology program, our geology and environmental, uh, geology, environment, and sustainability department uh, here. And he is also very active on a number of study abroad programs. Some of you in this audience might have been a, an alumni of, of the work that he's done in the Galapagos in South America. Uh, Dr. Bennington uh, graduated with a BS in, in, in biology and geology from the University of Rochester and a PhD in paleontology from Virginia Tech. He really works at that intersection of paleontology and statistics, which is interesting, in that he follows through how life changes over time. He's also worked extensively on the geology and geomorphology and hydrology here in our own corner of the world, Long Island. Uh, he is one of our best teachers on campus. He does a lot of work uh, in a number of different things besides paleontology. He's active with teaching uh, issue, issues related to science, mineralogy, water, and he also works with the New York State Council of Professional Geologists. And would you help me welcome Dr. Bennington to give us the lecture tonight. All right. Can, uh... Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for that uh, largely fabricated introduction. I, I feel old. When they, when they describe you as an institution, you're old. Uh, we will not be discussing statistics tonight, so, so relax. Um, what, what I want to talk about tonight are dinosaurs uh, in our own part of the world. And most people don't really think about dinosaurs coming from the, the eastern uh, part, of the, part of the continent. You know, and if you want to see dinosaurs in New York, you go to the American Museum of Natural History. Um, but these aren't really New York dinosaurs. Uh, they're from Wyoming. So they, they, would, not, they would not sound like uh, New York dinosaurs. All right, these are, these are uh, guests to, uh, to the Big Apple. So, yes, you know, the, the famous dinosaurs, uh, the, the names that are familiar, Apatosaurus, Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, those animals came from out west, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they were discovered back at the turn of the 20th century, in the late 1800s, turn of the 20th century by these famous fossil uh, collectors and paleontologists like Edward Drinker Cope and Charles Othniel Marsh. Um, but dinosaurs are present in the eastern part of the country. You don't have to go very far from Manhattan to find dinosaurs and dinosaur age rocks and fossils. 
And the significance of dinosaurs in our part of the world goes back a, a long way. So my, uh, my lecture today is going to sort of unfold in three parts. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is show you why dinosaurs, what, why the, this part of the world is significant for dinosaurs. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about where do you find them. You know, if you want to go out looking for dinosaurs and dinosaur age fossils, where do you look? And, and why do we have them here? And then we'll finish off by talking a little bit about why the dinosaurs we have in, in the New York part of the world are significant to our understanding of dinosaurs. So we'll start with uh, a little history lesson. Go back to the, to the beginning here. Um, dinosaurs were not known as to exist, really. And the word dinosaur didn't exist in the early 1800s. But it was in the early 1800s that people started to study the fossils that were coming out of the rock layers that were beginning to be understood as the Industrial Revolution was getting started and we were doing a lot of digging. Uh, and, and European geologists like Gideon Mantell, who was actually a physician, geology was his hobby. Um, William Buckland, who was a professor of geology at Oxford, these guys started to um, discover and describe uh, fossil bones. And they recognized them as reptiles. So Buckland is famous because he publishes the first description of what we, we recognize to be a dinosaur. And he knew it was a reptile. He knew it was very big. He named it Megalosaurus, which means big lizard. The big lizard of Stonesfield, where, where, where he found it. Uh, Gideon Mantell, who was a physician, um, traveled widely around the English countryside going on house calls. Uh, he had a, a very good reputation because his patients had a tendency to not die. And back then, if, if you, know, you found out about a physician who, whose patients were surviving, you, you made sure to get that physician. And while he was seeing patients, his wife would visit the local quarries and buy whatever fossils the quarrymen had uncovered. And he came across some very unusual teeth. Uh, and it took him a while to, to sort of figure out what they were. Um, he thought they might be rhinoceros teeth. Um, one day he was in the British Museum and there was a reptile expert who said, well, those look just like iguana teeth, but they're really, really big. They're like 10 times bigger than iguana teeth. So he named the, the teeth Iguanodon, the, the animal that possessed the teeth Iguanodon. Eventually he came a hold of, of some additional bones from the quarry that produced the teeth and he realized he had a, you know, he had a, a full uh, creature here. Um, up in the uh, upper left corner is his attempt to reconstruct the iguanodon. And you can see from the, from the diagram that he didn't have a lot of bones to work with. A few, a few vertebrae, um, some pieces of the pelvis, uh, leg bones. Uh, he didn't have the bones from the front leg. He just assumed the front leg would be similar to the hind leg. And then this, this interesting horn-like thing, which he stuck on, on the iguanodon's nose. It turns out that's the thumb, but, you know. I mean, he didn't know. He didn't have very much, very much to work with. And then um, he also came across this skeleton. Uh, again, not, not a lot to work with, basically a tail. But it included some interesting, whoops, go back, uh, some interesting um, little uh, plates, kind of like uh, flattened plates with a, with a little thorny bump. And he recognized that this was a, a kind of bony armor that this animal had and probably embedded in its skin. So he discovered the first armored dinosaur and named it uh, Hylaeosaurus. And short, you know, just a few years after these discoveries were, were made and, and were published, um, the preeminent paleontologist in England, a guy by the name of Sir Richard Owen, um, decided to take it upon himself to do a study of all of these big reptile, fossil reptiles that had been discovered in, in Britain. And um, he published on British fossil reptiles. And in this paper, he said, basically, these things are really big. They are definitely different from modern reptiles. And you know, they have different types of hip bones. And, and he recognized that their legs were underneath them and not sprawled out to the side. And he said, you know, these, these things deserve their own name. They, they are, they're a separate tribe of reptiles. And he came up with the term dinosauria, which means terrifying or awe-inspiring reptiles. And dinosaurs were, were born into the world. 
as we, as we uh, call them today. And, you know, they, dinosaurs were a big deal. People were interested in these things. The public was interested in dinosaurs. And shortly after Owen <clears throat> publishes his description of, of British fossil reptiles, the Prince of Wales suggests to Owen that, you know, we need to do something spectacular, you know, to, to bring these things to the, pe to the people, to satisfy their curiosity. So Owen teams up with uh, an artist, uh, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, who is a, a naturalist and an artist and a sculptor, and they decide to create life-size rep reconstructions of the dinosaurs that are, that are known and other prehistoric animals for what's essentially a world's fair, which is going on in London at the time. And this is called the Crystal Palace Exhibition. Um, it was uh, located in uh, a park uh, in London called Sydenham Park. And a huge wrought iron and glass building where you could go and see all of the technological marvels of the Victorian world. Uh, and then they, they created artificial lakes on, on the grounds of the park um, and islands where they had these reconstructions of dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals grouped by their age. So it was, it was Jurassic Park for the, for the Victorian era. And these are, these are some of the reconstructions. So there's the Iguanodon and the Megalosaurus. And it's interesting to look at the reconstructions. I mean, this is, this is the best that, that they could do with the, with the fossil material they had. So uh, Megalosaurus, all they really had was a jaw. So you have a crocodile-like jaw. And they knew that dinosaurs were animals that walked upright on their limbs. So you get something that looks like a reptilian version of the big bad wolf. <laughs> Again, it was the best, best they could do. And then the iguanodon kind of looks like a big, like a hybrid cow iguana thing <laughs> with, uh, you know, with uh, the bump on the end of the nose there. You know, and, and this, this, this is a cautionary tale because you know, these, were, these were highly educated people and doing the best they could with the evidence they had. And we recognize now that this is not even close to being accurate, accurate representations of dinosaurs, but it, it should make you wonder about how accurate are our modern representations of dinosaurs. What are the things about dinosaurs that we, we don't know now that we're going to find out in the future that's going to change our view? I mean, you know, now we know they, they were covered in feathers. You know, Tyrannosaurus rex was probably covered in at least very small feathers and maybe had some large showy feathers as well. Um, that was something that we didn't know about just a few years ago. So who knows? Who knows what's going to come along, come along next? There's uh, you can still see the reconstructions. They've uh, they've been renovated and and they're they're on display in the park. So uh, you can go um, go check them out uh, next time you're in London. All right. So just a little early history of of dinosaurs. What does it have to do with New York? Well. Now we have to cross the pond and come over to uh, eastern North America. And we're going to go straight to Haddonfield, New Jersey, a uh, little, little kind of uh, posh town in southern New Jersey. And uh, if you drive down Main Street in Haddonfield and, and turn onto one of the residential side streets and then turn off onto another residential side street and drive down to the end of the street, you come to a dead end. And there's a little uh, nature preserve. There's a little wooded area with a stream flowing through it and a parking area. And you realize pretty quickly that something's going on because you see this concrete bench that people have lovingly covered with plastic dinosaurs. And you turn around, and behind the bench is a plaque that describes why this site is so significant. And as the plaque says, I'll, I'll read it uh, a little bit. In a moral pit on the Johnny Hopkins farm in October of 1858, the world's first nearly complete dinosaur skeleton was unearthed by William Parker Folk. So the first nearly complete dinosaur ever found in the world was found in Haddonfield, New Jersey. Um, Folk was uh, visiting from Philadelphia. He was vacationing in, in New Jersey. He was staying at um, the uh, house of a, of a John Hopkins who, who had a, a farm. And he noticed that Hopkins was using um, fossil bones as doorstops and, and giving them away to, as souvenirs to visitors. And he, 
you know, wanted, asked him, well, where are the bones coming from? And they were coming from a, a pit that he had out uh, on the farm where he was digging up marl, which is a, which is a, a sedimentary material that's got a mix of uh, lime and this uh, iron-rich mineral called glauconite. So he was using it as, as soil conditioner and fertilizer. Uh, Folk arranged to uh, have the rest of the skeleton excavated and then sent the skeleton to Philadelphia to be studied by Joseph Leidy, who was the preeminent American vertebrate paleontologist at the time. There's, there's Leidy. And, and in Haddonfield today, there's a little alleyway in the middle of town, and you can go look at a life-size reconstruction of the Haddonfield hadrosaurus, or hadrosaurus folci, which means folk's bulky lizard. That's the, what it translates out to. There we go. Um, the bones of uh, hadrosaurus folci are in the collection of the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences. They're not currently on display, but they do have uh, whoops, replicas of the bones on display uh, in Philadelphia. And the significance of the hadrosaurus is in the limbs. It's, you can see it's not a tremendously complete skeleton. Um, no ribs were found, uh, just a little tiny piece of the jaw. Um, so they could recognize that it was a dinosaur related to the iguanodon. It had kind of iguanodon-like teeth. Otherwise, uh, nothing really known, nothing found of the skull. But the significance here is in the legs. Uh, it was very clear to Lighty that this animal walked on two legs because its front limbs were much shorter than its hind limbs. And this was the first inkling that anybody had that at least some dinosaurs were bipedal. And bipedalism is weird. There aren't a lot of animals that run around on two legs. Humans do, and, and other, other primates. Birds do, and kangaroos. And that's about it. Um, coincidentally, at this time, Hawkins, Waterhouse Hawkins, was on tour in America. He had been invited to come to the uh, United States and give a series of lectures. And he ended up collaborating with Leidy to create uh, the first mounted skeleton of a dinosaur, um, greatly filled in. You can see that they, they had to kind of make up a lot of bones here to make the complete skeleton. But uh, you know, a reasonable guess as to what it looked like. And even more interesting is that um, the city of New York uh, hired Waterhouse Hawkins to create something like the Crystal Palace exhibition or reconstructions of dinosaurs, but for Central Park in New York City. So the plan was that there was going to be a museum on the uh, southwestern corner of Central Park that would be called the Paleozoic Museum. And it was going to be this wrought iron and glass enclosed structure and, you know, sort of a uh, greenhouse garden. And there would be these islands with American prehistoric animals reconstructed by the great um, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. Uh, his studio, where he was starting to create these things, was in the armory building. Um, this is a woodcut drawing of the studio, and it's based off of a photograph. Um, that was taken of the studio. And you can see here, there's the Haddonfield hadrosaurus skeleton. There's the reconstruction of the living, the fleshed out Haddonfield hadrosaurus. And then there's a bunch of other prehistoric animals scattered around, some of them Ice Age mammals, um, some of them uh, different types of prehistoric reptiles that had been known. And that's what the Paleozoic Museum would have looked like. Now, we don't have a Paleozoic Museum in the southwestern corner of Central Park. So something went wrong. And what went wrong was politics. Um, what Hawkins was getting ready to get all this set up, and there was a change in political administration. And Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall were voted in to power in New York City. And they didn't have much interest in this project. So they cut off um, Hawkins funding. And he made the mistake of complaining publicly in the newspapers about how poorly he was being treated. So one night, a bunch of guys just showed up in his uh, studio and broke all of his models and sculptures into little teeny tiny pieces. And he went back to England. That was the, the very sort of classic New York story, I guess. You know, But that was the end of the Paleozoic Museum. Um, 
there he is, there's Boss Tweed. Coincidentally, at the same time that this was happening, a bunch of people were meeting in the Armory Building to plan a new museum for New York City that would become the American Museum of Natural History. Um, not to imply that they had anything to do with what happened to uh, Waterhouse Hawkins's work, but, um, but it's, it's literally the same year that, that Hawkins is, is sent packing, the American Museum gets going, and uh, you know, this beautiful building is, is built to house the museum in 1877. And in 1927, the Hall of Dinosaurs opens up for the, for the first time. It's a great, uh, great public acclaim. So New York you know, has its place in dinosaur history it, and, and you know, the New York region. The Hadrosaurus foci was the first nearly complete dinosaur ever found. And it showed us something we didn't know about dinosaurs, which was that many of them walked on two legs. All right, so part two now. Where do I dig? If you want to find dinosaurs, where do you go? Well, the basic trick to paleontology is if you want to dig up a particular fossil animal, you have to find rocks that are the right age to have that particular kind of animal. So this is the geologic time scale, which some of you might be, may be familiar with. The Earth forms 4.6 billion years ago, or 4,600 million years ago. And we are up here at the present. Um, the last 540 million years is sort of the age of animal life. And dinosaurs, dinosaurs evolve about 225, 230 million years ago. And they go extinct except for the birds. Birds are dinosaurs, by the way. They are, they are small feathered flying dinosaurs that are related to big, not, uh, big feathered non-flying meat-eating dinosaurs. But if you want to understand how dinosaurs behave, if you want to know what they look like, watch a chicken. Just follow a chicken around or any, any bird. And, and that's, if you want to know what dinosaurs tasted like, go to KFC. It's, that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Di dinosaurs, dinosaurs are still with us as, as birds. That's, that's, I think, one of the great... The great um, the great, not not really discoveries, but one of the, the one of the things, that, one of the most interesting things that paleontologists have managed to uh, to conclusively demonstrate in the last uh, twenty years or so. The clincher being the, the the findings in China of of dinosaurs covered in feathers. So it's anyway. So uh, di the, so the the non bird dinosaurs go extinct sixty five million years ago, and. Long Island uh, forms from glacial activity about 20,000 years ago or so. And just to put all that into perspective, uh, if we imagine that the age of the Earth is a single day, so we'll, let's pretend the Earth forms at midnight and then you know, 12.01 AM, and 24 hours later, it's the present at midnight here, um, that makes Long Island about fraction of a second old. Uh, it makes humans about 90 seconds old. So if, if the whole Earth you know, is a day, we've been around, or, or not, not even our species, but, but upright walking primates have been around for about 90 seconds. Dinosaurs evolve at about 1048 in the evening and mostly go extinct at 1140. Um, the first uh, animals, the first Shelley animals, show up in the fossil record at 9, 10 p.m. So you, what, what this demonstrates, well, a couple of things. One is that, that the history of the Earth is immensely long, and, and the fossil record comes along at kind of the end of the history of the Earth. Dinosaurs were around for a really long time, didn't come close to existing uh, contemporaneously with humans. Humans missed dinosaurs by a mile, and we're a relatively recent addition to the, to the planet. We haven't been here very long. Although we've done a very good job of taking over the place for ourselves. All right, so if you want to find dinosaurs, you need to look in rocks that are between 200 and, let's say, 40, 65 million years old. And the famous dinosaurs that come from the American West come from the American West because there are a lot of rocks out there that are the right age. And why are there all these rocks out in the American West that are the right age for dinosaurs? Well. 
that's a, an accident of geology. It turns out that during the time of dinosaurs, the western part of the United States was having a bunch of plate tectonic collisions. So, so tectonic plates were, whoops, go back, were coming in and colliding with the western edge of North America and pushing up mountain ranges. And when you push up a mountain range, the mountains erode. And when mountains erode, they make a lot of, a lot of dirt, a lot of sand, a lot of gravel, a lot of mud. It's carried away from the mountains by rivers, and it piles up next to the mountains and creates these enormous expanses of rivers and floodplains with lots and lots of plants, great habitat for animals. It's also a really good place to bury the carcasses of dead animals. Rivers are really good at burying things in sand and turning them into fossils. So during the Mesozoic, during the, the time that dinosaurs were around, you had repeated episodes of mountain building, um, geologists call mountain building, events orogenies. So you have this whole series of collisions that push up mountain ranges, the mountains erode, and do a really good job of, of burying all these dead dinosaurs and turning them into fossils. While all of this is happening out west, on the east coast, um, we have some old Appalachian mountains, but we're not really making mountains on the east coast. So the east coast doesn't, because it wasn't making mountains when dinosaurs were around, it doesn't create the, the perfect conditions for preserving dinosaurs that existed out in the, in the West. Nevertheless, we do have dinosaur age rock where we live. We have a big area of rock from the very beginning of the age of dinosaurs, from what we would call the late Triassic into the early Jurassic that stretches through central New Jersey and just up into New York State and then in central Connecticut and up into Massachusetts. And then we have rock layers from the very end of the age of dinosaurs, what geologists call the late Cretaceous, again, uh, in a belt that stretches across central New Jersey and under Long Island and pokes up in a few places on the north shore of Long Island. So you can, you can go to Comset State Park in Huntington and put your finger on dinosaur age layers of, uh, of sand and clay. And I'll, I'll show you some, some pictures of those in a few minutes here. All right, so what was going on when the dinosaurs were around? Well, on the East Coast, eastern part of North America experienced a whole bunch of mountain building collisions, a whole bunch of orogenies, but they all happened too early, right? Their dinosaurs evolve here. By the time dinosaurs show up, all these mountain building events on the East Coast were done. So we have lots of, lots of rock, thousands and thousands and thousands of feet of rock in the east with fossils, but the fossils are all older than dinosaur fossils. However, when the dinosaurs were around, there was one really important thing that happened. It wasn't a collision to build a mountain range. It was the opposite. It was a pulling apart. So what happens? There we go. So this is what the world looked like at the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. All of the continents were clumped together into one big continent. They'd all kind of smashed into each other. And this happens about every 500 million years because the Earth is a ball. And so if continents drift away from each other, if plate tectonics pushes continents away from each other, it's only a matter of time before they meet on the other side and they all clump together. So the last big clumping together of continents happened just as the age of dinosaurs was getting going. And then as the age of dinosaurs progressed, the continents broke apart. The supercontinent split up. And the Atlantic Ocean opens up between Africa and North America. And that pulling apart event creates some rock that's preserved with, with dinosaur fossils. And also, the shoreline, the coast of eastern North America, accumulates layers of sand and mud um, that, that pile up Along the, you know, along the shoreline um, through the age of dinosaurs. So when you pull a continent apart to create a new ocean, so back at the beginning of the age of dinosaurs, Africa and North America are glued together. They pull away from each other, and that stretching causes big sections of the crust to uh, break apart and sink. You, you, you open up cracks, and, and blocks of the crust sink, and that creates valleys. And those valleys fill up with 
sand and gravel and mud and big lakes. They're called rift valleys. And anywhere you're collecting sand and gravel and mud in a big depression, you have the, the possibility of preserving fossils. So there are these, these, these depressions, these rift valleys that opened up when Africa and North America pulled away from each other, all up and down the eastern margin of North America, including northern New Jersey up into New York and then central Connecticut and central Massachusetts. These are called Mesozoic Rift Basins. That's the technical term. And they contain a, a layer cake of rocks that include sedimentary rocks with fossils and also volcanic rocks because when you stretch the crust, you open it up and allow magma from the mantle of the earth to come up and erupt out onto the surface. So let's, let's um, take a little, uh, a little mental field trip here. There's New York City. Interstate 80 west across northern New Jersey. Patterson, New Jersey is right about there. There's an aerial view, so uh, let me orient you here. I took this picture on a flight to, uh, I forget where I was going, somewhere. <laughs> took off out of LaGuardia. Uh, so there's the George Washington Bridge. There's uh, upper Manhattan here. You can see the, the Harlem River where it bends around and joins the Hudson. The Palisades Cliffs. So as soon as you cross the George Washington Bridge, you're into dinosaur country. These rocks are about 200 million years old. They are from the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. And there's New York City. There's the Palisades Cliff. So there's a whole layer cake of rocks. Some of them are igneous. So the Palisades Cliffs are a big mass of what was once magma that was injected below the surface of the Earth and cooled to form rock. Um, but and then uh, when you get in around Patterson, you have uh, lava flows. But in between the lava flows and the, and the magma rock, you have lots of layers of sedimentary rock, which contain fossils from the beginning of the age of dinosaurs. Uh, some of those layers formed in these big lakes that, that pooled up inside the rift valleys. They're called rift lakes. And those, those rocks are usually these very thin black shales. And if you peel them apart very carefully, you find the things that you expect to live in lakes. You find fish fossils, like this uh, semi semionotus here. Um, you find phytosaurs. Phytosaurs look like crocodiles, and they're very distantly related to crocodiles. But you can tell a phytosaur is not a crocodile because of where its nostrils are. Crocodiles have their nostrils at the end of their nose. Phytosaurs have their nostrils above their eyes on the top of their head. They have the same lifestyle. They float around just under the water and wait for something to swim too close and then eat it. But just they superficially similar. They're similar because they evolved to live the same way, but they're not very closely related. They're kind of distant cousins. And then, and then dinosaurs. We find dinosaur fossils in these rocks. Um, the fossils we find tend to be footprints, trackways. So here's a nice three-toed trackway that we call Growlator, which was made by a small dinosaur, maybe something like the dinosaur Coelophysis. Um, paleontologists give the footprints a different name than the dinosaur they think that made them. And the reason for that is, well, one, you can never be sure that a particular species of dinosaur made a particular footprint unless you find the skeleton embedded in the footprint. And that's extremely rare. Uh, I actually don't know of, well, I think there's one case where, where a dinosaur skeleton was found associated with a footprint. But also, a whole bunch of different species of dinosaur that are kind of closely related could all make exactly the same footprint. So, and, and the same species of dinosaur can make different footprints depending on whether it's walking on soft mud, hard mud, sand. So it just doesn't make sense to name, you just give the footprint a name so, so you, you can talk to, about it with other people just to kind of keep a record of it. All right, so, and, and the cool thing here is that we have, we have rocks from the end of the Triassic period, and we have rocks from the beginning of the Jurassic period. So we have two different ages in the history of dinosaurs represented by these rocks. And when you get into the Jurassic, in addition to layers with fossils, you have layers of, massive layers of lava rock. So, there were enormous volcanic eruptions going on between the end of the Triassic and the beginning of the Jurassic. Huge volumes of magma were just 
welling up and pouring out onto the surface is lava and covering hundreds and thousands of square miles with, uh, with molten rock, kind of just paving over everything. Um, and this happened several times over the course of, uh, of several million years. The, the layered rocks, the sedimentary rocks, are also interesting because they come in different colors. And the colors represent different environments that are coming and going as the climate changes. So the red rocks are floodplain environments, um, sort of like you know dried up riverbeds and things. The beige rocks are lakeshore environments. And the, the black rocks and gray rocks are underwater lake environments. So what you're seeing here is a floodplain and then a big lake filling up in the valley and then the lake drying up and going back to a floodplain as the climate gets wetter and drier over tens of thousands of years. So you had, you had an interesting story of climate change going on and all these different environments coming and going through time. Um, all of these environments are good for, for making fossils, but none of them are good for preserving bones. So we have a really terrible record of dinosaur bones from these Triassic Jurassic rocks in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, just a handful of bones have been found. Instead, what we have are footprints and a series of footprints called trackways, lots and lots of them. So if you're ever driving on Interstate 91 going north towards Hartford, uh, 10 minutes south of Hartford, you can pull off the road. Um, about a mile away from the interstate is Dinosaur State Park. And Dinosaur State Park is a place where back in the 1970s, they started to build a motor vehicle building. They dug the foundation. And they were peeling up the rock. And they uncovered thousands of dinosaur footprints. And, and fortunately, they said, oh, we can build the motor vehicle building somewhere else. We're going to put a dome over this and turn it into a museum and, and a beautiful park. So if you've never been to Dinosaur State Park, put it on your list. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's literally a mile off the interstate. Um, what's the, uh, I can't think of the name of the town that it's near. What's that? It's, it's not Rockfield. It's Rock some, Rocky Hill. It's Rocky Hill. Rocky Hill, thank you. And it's interesting. You have these, these fairly large dinosaur trackways. I brought one. Um, one of the fun things you can do at Dinosaur State Park is you can, if you bring plaster and some vegetable oil, you can, you can make a copy of one of the dinosaur footprints that they have you know, outside of the museum. They have, they have forms, and you pour the plaster in. And you can bring home your own dinosaur footprint. So this is, uh, this is an example. Pretty big dinosaur, three toes, uh, claw marks. So a big predatory dinosaur was running around making all those footprints. And, you know, paleontologists are sort of puzzled about why you have all these predatory dinosaurs and, and nobody else. What were they doing? Um, they don't seem to be going in any particular direction. It almost seems like they lost, you know, like, like one dinosaur lost its car keys and the other dinosaurs are trying to, you know, helping it, trying to find the car keys and they're just kind of wandering around. Um, I, I'm not kidding. It's, it's a big puzzle as to why you have so many tracks of the same dinosaur. I have to say, though, um, Now that, that's the, the track is called Eubrontes, and the dinosaur that made it was probably something like a Dilophosaur, kind of a mid-sized um, predatory dinosaur that was running around in, in Arizona in the early Jurassic, and possibly something like it out here on the East Coast. Um, what I was going to say was, uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was in uh, Ecuador in the Amazon basin with uh, um, Jason, Jacob. Sorry, Jacob. You, you come up here and try and do this. <laughs> anyway, um, we, uh, we took a canoe ride down the river to a big lake um, called um, uh, Laguna Grande. And when we got there, it's the dry season, there was no lake. There was a lot of mud, though. And this is, this is the river where it enters the lake. And you see all these egrets out there. And you've got all the same kind of egret wandering around, and a lot of mud, as I said, and a lot of footprints in the mud. And they're all egret footprints. Uh, that's the same thing. This is what was going on 
in back in the early Jurassic. You had a bunch of uh, predators that were just wandering around the lake shore. They may have been looking for fish, you know, that were stranded when the when the water dried up. And I mean, I I really hadn't thought much about this till we got out of the canoe and we're walking around and looking at all this mud and all these trackways. And it's like I've seen this before. Yeah, I've seen it as dinosaur trackways in uh, in Connecticut. And uh, there's a pretty good variety of trackways. So even though we only have footprints, we can tell a lot about what kind of dinosaurs were living in the area, um, their sizes. Uh, we can tell predators from herbivores. Um, this, this is just an example of the fact that, that the same dinosaur can make very different footprints depending on the mud that it's walking through. Um, and there are lots of places uh, where footprints are exposed. You can go study them. This is a photograph from a field trip I took my dinosaur class uh, to uh, last summer. This is the Connecticut River, so up in, up in uh, so uh, southern Massachusetts near South Hadley. You have all these rock layers, and you walk along the, the shore of the river here, and you can find dinosaur trackways like that one. That's a growlator, small predatory dinosaur. Um, if you measure the, the spacing between the tracks and the size of the tracks, you can make some estimates as to how fast the animals were, were walking or running when the trackways were made, which is, which is fun to do. And then you can, you can identify different types of dinosaurs. This is the large predatory dinosaur, the Eubrontes track. This is the smaller one, smaller predatory dinosaur, the Growlator. Uh, this is a small three-toed uh, dinosaur without very big claws that we think was a small bipedal herbivore. Something like uh, Scutellosaurus, which is an early, uh, an early armored dinosaur here. Um, the only dinosaur fossils found in New York State proper, so, so far everything we've been talking about has been New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Um, the, the early dinosaur age rocks with the footprints do extend up into New York, and there is a place um, in Nyack, uh, just up along the Hudson River, where dinosaur trackways have been found. And there's a guy who lives out on the north shore of Long Island who has found two dinosaur footprints on the beach um, 10 years apart. I don't, he's, he's, he either spends a lot of time on the beach or he's very lucky. And these are, these are trackways that are from Connecticut. They were picked up by the glacier, carried to Long Island, and, and deposited as, as part of Long Island. And then this, this, was, uh, this showed up in the newspaper from Eaton's Neck up near Northport. Uh, and it was uh, said to be a dinosaur trackway, but there's no way that's a dinosaur footprint. It doesn't even come close. All right, and then the end of the age of dinosaurs, we have from the late Cretaceous this belt of sediment, a belt of layers of, of uh, sand and mud that extends up from the south across central New Jersey and underneath Long Island. And why, why do we have layers from the end of the age of dinosaurs? It's because at, at the end of the age of dinosaurs during the Cretaceous, um, global sea level was really high. There was no ice in the world. There were no glaciers anywhere. All that water was in the oceans. And also, um, seafloor was being produced at a really high rate. So the mid-ocean ridges were, moving, were spreading very quickly. So there was a lot of young, very warm ocean floor kind of floating up on the mantle and displacing the water upward. So the coastline back then would have been all the way up against the Appalachian Mountains and places like Philadelphia, uh, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, they would have been under water and, and sometimes they would have been under hundreds of feet of, of water. And so what is now dry land along the coastal plain was underwater and collecting layers of mud and sand being deposited offshore. So here's a, here's a diagram that shows that there's this, uh, this region called the coastal plain, which is a layer cake of layers of sediment. It's not really rock. It hasn't been turned to rock. It's never been buried deep enough. It's just compacted sand and mud uh, that goes all the way back to about 70, uh, well, actually about 90 million years ago or so. So the bottom of the pile, about 90 million years, going up to the top of the pile, which is the beach sand that's on the shore today. And there are bits and pieces of dinosaur that's come out of these layers. And now, why, why don't we find lots of dinosaurs in these layers? 
I'll throw the question out there. Why, why aren't these layers of sediment filled with dinosaur remains? You guys, what do you think? You take a guess? Why don't we find a lot of, we find a, a few bits and pieces of dinosaurs in these layers, but we don't find lots of dinosaurs. It's not that we're not finding them. It's that there's just not a lot of dinosaur stuff there. What do you think? No, if, they, if their fossils were there, we'd find them, even if they were broken into small pieces. Um, where did, di did dinosaurs live in the ocean? No, they only lived on land. That's the problem. These layers were deposited on the floor of the ocean, which where dinosaurs didn't live. The only reason you would find a dinosaur in these layers is if a dead dinosaur got washed out to sea, maybe during a flood or something. So they're, they're rare. There's lots of other fossils in these layers, just not much in the way of dinosaurs. So bits and pieces. We have found a few teeth and claws from a tyrannosaur that we call Dryptosaurus. We don't really know much about it. We just know it, it was around. And, and just a few bits and pieces made it out into the ocean, um, preserved as fossils. Just this year, down in Alabama, in the same kinds of rocks from the same age, they found a nearly complete skeleton of a duckbill dinosaur, a hadrosaur, uh, with near, a nearly complete skull. So this is ver a very unusual find. And of course, our Haddonfield hadrosaurus is from these layers. And it's, you know, it's a very unusual find. So it's been, you know, in New Jersey, people have been digging around in these layers for 150 years, and we've only found one decent dinosaur skeleton and just a handful of bits and pieces of, of, of other dinosaurs. Enough to kind of show us what was around, but, but otherwise not very much. So this is what these, these layers look like. It's this sort of gray material. Uh, it's a mix of mud and, and this interesting kind of green sand. Um, if you dig around, you find lots of fossils. You find fossil oysters, fossil squid, fossil brachiopods. You find, uh, if, you, if you scoop up the gravel and sieve it, you can find shark teeth. Lots of shark teeth if you're having a good day. And Jacob and I were having a good day when we did this. Uh, there's a fossil snail. This is a tooth from a fish, a spiky tooth growing out of the jaw. And there are a few, like this, this tooth here is probably from a reptile. All right, so you, you spend a few hours sieving, you can find some pretty interesting stuff. Uh, if you're having a really good day, you might find a big spiky fish tooth from this enormous herring called Encodus. And if you're having a really, really awesome day, you might find a Mosasaur tooth like this one, which uh, I didn't find that. Somebody else found it. I got to take a picture of it, that's all. One of my students found a tooth almost that big once on one of our collecting trips. And uh, he took it home, and I could never get him to bring it back to school. He wouldn't do it. He was convinced I was going to take it away from him. So that's a, that's a Mosasaur, uh, reconstruction of a Mosasaur, basically a, a big swimming Komodo dragon. That some of them got to be you know, 9, 12, 18, I think up to 30 feet long, some species. Um, the last thing you would have seen snorkeling in the late Cretaceous, the last thing. There is, in, in central New Jersey, there is a, a quarry called the Iversand, um, Iversand uh, Greensand Quarry, which was a commercial quarry that closed just a few years ago, and it has been purchased by a small university called Rowan University, and it's now a fossil collecting site. I have not yet been there, um, but you go online, you can, you can apparently uh, make arrangements to go visit it. And there's a paleontologist who's now at Rowan University, he was at Drexel, um, who is working this, uh, this pit and, and finding all kinds of really cool um, marine fossils. So there's a nice chunk of Mosasaur jaw, uh, Ken, Ken Lacavara. This is a picture I took in his lab. Um, nice, sharp, pointy Mosasaur teeth, sort of like a killer whale kind of animal here. Uh, there's a turtle, sea turtle. A uh, different kind of sea turtle, uh, kind of more similar to modern sea turtles. Uh, it looks like Batman, but it's, uh, it's a crocodile, a marine a, a aquatic crocodile from the, from the Cretaceous. Uh, as I said, these layers go under Long Island. 
Um, they're important because our drinking water is actually coming. Most of our drinking water is coming from these layers of Cretaceous uh, sands and, and gravels um, that are sitting under Long Island. There's, there's thousands of feet of them and holding something like 100 trillion gallons of fresh water that keeps, keeps Long Island going. They poke up above the surface in just a few places where the glaciers, as they were coming down from the north, kind of bulldoze this stuff up and, and push some of it up and mixed it in with the, with the glacial sediments. So along the north shore, in a few places, you can find uh, layers of sand and clay from the Cretaceous. And you can find fossils, mostly plant fossils. Um, some ferns, some leaves and things. Um, there's no reason why there shouldn't be a dinosaur in there somewhere. No one's found it yet. So you could be the first, right? Start, start searching. You know, make some time on the weekends and go up and, and start poking around because it's only a matter of time before somebody finds some dinosaur teeth or something coming out of some of these, uh, some of these layers. Just hasn't been done yet. All right, let's see how much time I got left. Just, just a, I'm going to go real quick here. Um, the last part of the talk I call Revenge of the Nerds, and you'll see why in a second. Um, why is, is, is any of this important? I mean, what, what, are we learning anything interesting from the, our local dinosaur age layers and fossils? And the answer is yes, we are. Um, and the reason for this is there are two really important events in the history of dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs evolve here in the Triassic, but when dinosaurs first appear in the fossil record, they are not very important. There are not many of them, they're not very big, and there are not very many different kinds. There are lots of other reptiles running around that are bigger and badder and more ecologically important than dinosaurs. And then for some reason, at the very end of the Triassic, most of these other groups of reptiles go extinct and dinosaurs are left to take over the world. And we don't really know why. So that's a really interesting, important event. What is it that allowed dinosaurs to go from just another big reptile that was running around to the dominant terrestrial life forms on Earth. And then, of course, the extinction of the dinosaurs, or the non-bird dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, that's another really big event that we'd like to understand better than we do. All right, there are the nerds. These are the people who developed the hypothesis, or the theory, I should say, really, that a large asteroid collided with the Earth at the end of the Mesozoic and wiped out the dinosaurs, that the, the effects of that impact wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, this is a physicist, his, his ne'er-do-well geologist son. I'm sure he was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Your son becomes a geologist. Probably, probably not a happy day. Um, and then a couple of geochemists here. And these guys are the ones who developed evidence that a big rock collided with uh, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and led to the, um, the rapid extinction of all of the, again, the non-bird dinosaurs. And the evidence that they developed for this, it started with the fact that they noticed an, a, a lot of a very rare element right at, you know, in the layers that mark the end of the age of dinosaurs, the elements called iridium. It's very rare in the crust of the Earth. It's much more common in meteorites. So they started finding lots of iridium at the very top of the dinosaur age layers. And they thought, well, where's that iridium coming from? And they surmised it must be coming from some kind of meteor you know, input, meteor impact. And eventually, we found a crater and more evidence for the impact. So when a, when a big meteor strikes the Earth and creates a big explosion, it melts a lot of rock, throws its molten rock up into the atmosphere, where it cools into little blobs of glass that come raining back down onto the surface. Um, probably really hot when they come back to the surface. They light forest fires. It's, it's, you don't want to be around when this is happening. When it's raining molten glass, it's just not a good day. Uh, eventually, they found a crater. So there's a buried crater up there in the Yucatan Peninsula. It's a, it's a big crater. It's not a, not a minor thing. So this was, this was a bad day, for sure. Um, interestingly enough, uh, if you drill down into the coastal plain of New Jersey, when you, when you reach the boundary between the layers that have Cretaceous or Mesozoic or Dinosaur Age fossils, and the layers that don't, there is a thin layer of little, little clay balls there, which are the remnants of that molten glass that came raining down out of the sky. So we can find actual evidence for a big impact in the New Jersey coastal plain, which is, which is really cool. 
But interestingly enough, uh, they also find, so there, there's the layer with the little glass balls, and there are blobs of clay above that layer that have the same fossils you have below the layer. So there's a little hint that maybe, maybe that impact wasn't really the end. Um, you, can explain, you can explain that away. Let me do that. Um, maybe, maybe some of this got mixed in, but, but I, think, I think this is telling us something that maybe, maybe that big impact wasn't the, the very end. Um, another thing that came to light recently is, uh, again, in New Jersey, they were, they were rebuilding a bridge abutment. They, they dug into the, the hillside, exposed some, some rock or some of these layers. And there's, there's iridium. There's a, there's a layer of iridium there, which presumably marks the day the asteroid hit. And then there's a, about a foot of sediment above that loaded with typical fossils from the Cretaceous. So at least in this one little spot, it looks like the impact didn't really, didn't really have a huge uh, effect on the marine creatures that were living on the, you know, off the coast of New Jersey. Interesting, interesting little, little hint there. So New Jersey turns out to be one of the best places in the world to look at evidence for what was happening at the very, very end of the age of dinosaurs. And that, that green sand pit is a really interesting place as well. The, the paleontologist who's working on that thinks that he has found evidence for a huge die-off of sea creatures that all piled up on the sea floor. Um, he hasn't published on it yet, but, but in talking to him, he's, he's sort of, that's his working hypothesis. I have a counter hypothesis. I think I could probably demonstrate that those things accumulated over a really long period of time and weren't just wiped out all of a sudden. So, so you know, the argument over whether the asteroid snuffed out the dinosaurs or whether it was just one more really bad thing that was already kind of stressing them out is, is ongoing and it's being played out in part in, uh, in, in these things in, New, in rocks in New Jersey. And then going back to the beginning of the age of dinosaurs again, um, at the end of the Triassic, the world is full of things besides dinosaurs and then most of them go extinct and when the Jurassic begins, um, only dinosaurs uh, are left. And the record of footprints that we have in New Jersey and in, in Massachusetts and Connecticut shows us this. So you can see a change in the kinds of footprints and the variety of footprints. And there's a geologist named Paul Olson, uh, who is now at Princeton, um, who has been looking for evidence of an asteroid impact at the end of the Triassic. And, and his idea is that, well, if an asteroid wiped out the dinosaurs and made room for the mammals to take over the world, maybe an asteroid wiped out all these other reptiles and made room for the dinosaurs to take over the world. So, you know, the asteroid giveth and the asteroid taketh away. You know, it, it, that's, that's his, his hypothesis. He's found a little bit of evidence for iridium at the very, very end of the Triassic. But, you know, when, when the Triassic was drawing to a close and the Jurassic was beginning, that's when you have all of these layers of lava being erupted. There's tremendous volcanic activity going on, and that's going to be altering the Earth's atmosphere, um, altering the chemistry of the oceans. And a lot of paleontologists think that, that asteroids are sort of a red herring, that, that what really has an impact on life on Earth is when you have these massive episodes of volcanic eruptions that go on for hundreds of thousands of years and keep stressing the Earth continuously. An asteroid impact is over in, in a short period of time, but, a, but these massive volcanic episodes go on for a long time. So again, you know, the, our, our local rock layers have a lot to teach us about, about these very, very important events in the history of, of dinosaurs. All right. Or, you know, there are other explanations for what wiped out the dinosaurs. Could have been uh, bad, bad personal habits, or maybe they just missed the boat. I don't know. Thank you very much. All right, all right, what an interesting lecture. We have time for questions. If you, if you have a question, if you could come down here by the microphones so we can catch you, uh, uh, so we can record you so the people online and uh, watching uh, into the future can hear you. So please come on up. 
if you have questions. Or are, are the folks around here will hand you a microphone as well. Testing. Yep, that works. This one's on. All right, our first question. Yes. I'd like to know if you have any theory as to why dinosaurs, uh, the birds, survived. So the why did the birds survive if all the other dinosaurs right. if went extinct? If the air is, is uh, uh, compromised, yeah. that they're breathing, uh, how did the birds manage to survive? And, and you call them our modern day dinosaurs. Yeah, well, they, sure. Um, that's a great question, and I, I, I have no idea why. <laughs> no, one, no one does. But um, it may have something to do with size, because if you look at what survives and what doesn't survive, in terms of vertebrate animals, in terms of land animals, um, small things do better than big things. Uh, so maybe, maybe it's size. Maybe, um, maybe, I don't know. You know, what is it about the ecology of birds that would allow them to better weather uh, ongoing climate change? I don't know. But, I mean, that's 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 a million dollar question. Hey, David. Uh, the question I have is really about when they reconstruct dinosaurs. I realize that certain things. Oh yeah, can hear you. Oh, closer to the mic. The question is, how do they reconstruct dinosaurs? I realize you have the leg bone and hip bone and something like that, but when there seems to be a leap of faith, how, you know, how big a leap, and where do they make the assumptions? So that's that's an excellent question. How do you how do you flesh out a, a dinosaur from a skeleton? Um, you start with the bones, and even there, there's controversy. You know, so so bones articulate, and but it's not always clear exactly how how much range of motion you have. So uh, one of the one of the controversies with dinosaurs for some dinosaurs is did they did you know were their limbs partially sprawly? The, the horn dinosaurs, Triceratops. There's an ongoing argument over whether the forelimbs of Triceratops were sprawled or, or directly underneath each other. And you can get at that with footprints. And the footprints seem to suggest that they were fairly upright. But it's not exactly clear from how the, the, the um, femur, or I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, humerus articulates with the shoulder um, exactly what would have been the correct posture. Uh, there's a lot of things we don't know about dinosaur physiology. The long neck dinosaurs present a real puzzle because you have a, let's say, you have a 30 foot long neck. If you raise your neck up in the air and, and move your head from chest level to 30 feet above your chest, um, you'd better have some mechanism for changing your blood pressure real fast. Because a head that's 30 feet higher than the heart needs, you know, the blood is just not going to flow there unless you can ramp up your blood pressure immediately. Uh, so when you raise your head, you're going to pass out if you don't have some a soft tissue mechanism for, for shooting blood up to your brain. Likewise, when you lower your head, you'd better turn that mechanism off or your head's going to explode from the blood pressure. And there are paleontologists who argue that sauropods, these long-necked dinosaurs, never lifted their heads, that, that their necks were there so they could graze like this, and that they, they weren't able to do this, which ecologically doesn't make any sense. I mean, you've got tall trees full of food. Uh, and it, it just it seems unlikely to me that evolution would would create these long necks for feeding and not and and you know that they wouldn't adapt over tens of millions of years to be able to lift them up somehow. But but the soft tissue that would make that those blood pressure changes possible just doesn't preserve as fossils. So you know you end up with these arguments that that are very difficult to resolve and. And one, you know, you can create computer models of the neck bones and, you know, try and see if the neck is capable of flexing in a way that would allow it to be lifted up. If, if you can demonstrate that the bones don't articulate to allow the neck to raise up, then you can, you can plausibly argue that they couldn't do that. But, you know, you'll never know for sure. Um, you can put muscles on the bones by looking at where the bones are rough because muscles need rough bone to attach to. So, and, and also, you know, dinosaurs are not alien creatures. They're vertebrates, and they have the same basic skeletal um, framework and the same basic musculature that all other terrestrial vertebrates have. 
So you know, you know what muscles should be there, and, and you can see where they attach, and you can try and figure out how big they were based on their attachment sites and based on, on how thick the bones were that they attached to. Um, so you can try and flesh out the musculature. The, the guts are, are hard to do because there's just no fossil preservation of the soft tissue in the digestive system. So we make lots of assumption about how dinosaurs were digesting stuff. And then when you get to the outer surface, the skin, we rely on um, fossil impressions of skin to show us what kind of skin dinosaurs have. And, and most of our skin impressions show a kind of a, a sort of very uh, scaly skin. But it turns out that almost all dinosaur skin impressions are coming from one particular group of dinosaurs that lived at the very end of the age of dinosaurs. And we may be, we may be assuming that all dinosaurs had that particular type of scaly skin, and, and that may not be a good assumption. Um, it was a long time, it was only recently that we realized that most, uh, that at least most, if not all, predatory dinosaurs had feathers. And it was just a question of, of waiting around until somebody found the right rocks with the right preservation to preserve feathers. Feathers are pretty resistant to decay. They will hang around for a long time before they finally just disintegrate and disappear. And given just the right conditions, they'll hang around long enough to create an impression in the surrounding mud that, that comes out as a feather fossil. Uh, we've discovered recently that, that, that some of the, the pigment in feathers isn't in the form of chemical pigment. It's in the form of melanosomes, which are these little cellular structures that, that have a different morphology depending on what color they are. And so we've been able to, to at least begin to reconstruct color patterns in, in some of the feathered dinosaurs based on those. Um, so, you know, we, we try and piece it together but from the evidence, but there's a lot of, a lot of room for conjecture. And it's, you know, unfortunately with extinct animals, you, you, they're not around anymore. You, you, you'll, you'll never know for sure. You know, if, 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 if you can't handle uncertainty, don't become a paleontologist. <laughs> Um, you can pull it closer. You said earlier that the best way to find out if a fossil is in the area would be the qual the age of the surrounding rock. Right. How would one figure this out? That's 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 a great question. It's actually a really difficult question to answer. Um, it's a simple question with a complicated answer. The simple answer is uh, you you find some geologic maps. So geologists have been mapping out the age of rock layers around the world for 200 years or so. Now, how do we know how old a rock layer is? We, in most cases, we look at the fossils in that rock layer. So rocks from the Mesozoic era have particular kinds of organisms as fossils. Now that seems like a contradiction. It's like, how do you know how, the, you know, how, do you know how, where, how to find Jurassic fossils? Oh, you look in Jurassic rocks. How do you know the rocks of Jurassic in age? Well, they have Jurassic fossils. It sounds like a tautology, but it isn't. And, and the reason it isn't it has to do with, with the way geologists have pieced together the sequence of rock layers. And I mean, I've got a whole two hour lecture and group project in my historical geology class to walk people through this because it's, it, is, it is a little bit tricky. But, it works like this, basically. If, if, if you walk up to a cliff somewhere and look at the rock layers in the cliff, the layers on the bottom are older than the layers on the top. They have to be. It's like building a brick wall. You can't start at the top and lay bricks on top and then work your way down. You start at the bottom, the layer of bricks, next layer of bricks. So rocks form the same way. So in any one place, the, the sequence of rock layers is showing you old to young. And you look at the fossils and you see, OK, the fossils in these layers are older than the fossils in these layers, which are older than the fossils in these layers. So you can see the sequence of fossils. And you know which are older and which are younger. Now you go somewhere else, and you find another pile of rocks with another sequence of fossils. All right? And you go somewhere else. And you get a whole bunch of different sequences of rock with, with sequences of fossils in them. And then you start trying to match them up. And what you find is that you have a pile of rocks over here, and the fossils in the layer at the top of that pile are the same ones you find in the layer at the bottom of this pile. So you can match those two layers and now you know these layers and these fossils belong on top of these. 
And then you go to those layers and you discover, aha, the bottom of those layers matches the top of this pile and you put them up there. So this is what geologists were doing in Europe in the late 17 and early 1800s. They were traveling around the countryside describing their local layer cake of rocks and fossils and then eventually they figured out that the fossils always came in the same sequence. And we now know that's because of evolution. Things evolve, they hang around for a short period of time, they go extinct, and they never come back. Extinctions forever. So fossils are, are unique in time. And, and it was just a matter of, of going to different parts of, the, of Europe and observing the, the rocks and fossils and then, and then tying them together until they had a, a, you know, a pretty much a master sequence. And now, you go anywhere in the world and you look at the rock layers, you look at the fossils, and you match them up to the master sequence and you see where they fit. So rocks from the Jurassic period will have certain types of fossils that only existed in the Jurassic and we recognize those. And so we use the fossils to recognize that rocks are from a particular time period. But, but that, that, that sequence that we use to date the layers had to be worked out and it's still being refined. If you want to make a lot of money as a paleontologist, you become very good at identifying really tiny fossils in the rock, microfossils, and using those fossils to match up layers from different places. And you go work for Shell or Chevron or an oil company. And they will pay you six-figure salaries to match the rocks up and, and figure those things out. Because if you can figure out the pattern of the rocks, you can figure out where the oil's hiding. So great question, simple question, complicated answer. Hello. Um, do you think sometime down the road, is it genetically possible to recreate a Jurassic Park? Oh, that's a great question. So if, if, if we, if we, if we de-extinct dinosaurs, the science of de-extinction, it will almost certainly not be from extracting DNA from mosquitoes preserved in amber, which is what they did in Jurassic Park. And there, there's lots of reasons for this. Uh, one reason is that when a mosquito ingests blood from a dinosaur, uh, powerful enzymes in the gut of the mosquito digest that blood very quickly and chop the DNA up into tiny little pieces. So in some ways, the belly of a mosquito is the worst place to try and get DNA from. Um, you're just going to have little bits and pieces of DNA, and, and it's going to be very difficult to put them back together. And even if you could reconstruct the genome of the dinosaur, how do you translate that into a living dinosaur? It's not just a simple matter of taking that DNA and sticking it in a frog egg or a, or a lizard egg or something. It's just not going to work. Um, the genes inside of, a, of an egg uh, communicate with the cytoplasm of the egg uh, in very complicated ways to, to, to allow the embryo to begin to develop. So I don't, I don't, think, I don't think the ancient DNA route is going to help us. We're interested in dinosaur DNA because if we can get even little pieces of dinosaur DNA, we can compare dinosaur DNA to other dinosaur DNA, or we could compare dinosaur DNA to bird DNA and learn more about where dinosaurs fit in, in an evolutionary scheme. But we're not going to reconstruct dinosaurs. If you want to reconstruct a dinosaur, you, all you got to do is take a chicken and genetically <laughs> reverse engineer it. Because all the genes to make a dinosaur are still in that chicken. They've just been switched off. So the genes to make teeth, the genes to make, um, uh, well, a snout instead of a beak, they're all there. They've just, the, the switches have been altered by, by evolution to give you a chicken instead of a small, toothy, um, snouty dinosaur. And I don't think it's going to take very long for us to figure out how to flip those switches back the other way and reverse engineer a dino chicken. There are people actually playing around with this right now. There was a paper that just came out recently on, on looking, at, looking at the embryology of, of the development of bird beaks. And, and the people who were doing the research did some manipulations and basically prevented bird embryos from developing beaks. The birds, you know, the embryos started to grow a snout instead of a beak. They started to grow a dinosaur-like face instead of a bird face. So, so that's, that's, you know, we probably won't recreate any species of dinosaur that existed will just make new dinosaurs. It's a chicken that eats you. <laughs> but that's, you know, genetic manipulation of living organisms is what's going to bring dinosaurs back, I think. 
Well, on that note, before we close, I just want to thank everyone for being here tonight on behalf of Hofstra University and the Hofstra Cultural Center. Our next science lecture is next week, Wednesday, at 11.15 for our Darwin Day event in the Guthrie Theater in the library. And there'll be some reenactments from Darwin's life. And, a, and someone who's on the stage, and it's not me, might actually be uh, portraying Mr. Darwin. So you, it's one of those you can't miss events. Thank you.